Welcome back, mitochondriacs. Due to the interest and demand when talking about mitochondrial heteroplasmy, and in particular, how to reverse mitochondrial heteroplasmy, here we are for another video of mitochondrial heteroplasmy. We have seen this slide in the past, and essentially, to recap, we're going to have some cell stressor, and generally, that's going to come in the form of either inflammation or reactive oxygen species. That's generally how most cells are damaged. There are other mechanisms, don't get me wrong, but those are the main ones, and we'll talk about that at length about how that happens and how to prevent that from happening in the mitochondrial redox series. However, we're going to have some stressor. It's going to damage the mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA are plentiful in terms of copy number. It does vary depending on the mitochondria and the cell type, but you have a lot of mitochondrial DNA in the mitochondrial matrix. And because it's in the same location of the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain, we have a lot of things going on. We have mitochondrial metabolism converting macromolecules into usable energy, ATP, through through oxfos or oxidative phosphorylation. And in that process, we're going to produce some physiologic amount of reactive oxygen species. And that's going to have a small effect on damaging the mitochondrial DNA, which is right there, right next to it. However, when we have excess ROS, either from an outside source or from an inside source, such as dysfunctional mitochondrial respiration, and we're hyperproducing mitochondrial ROS or reactive oxygen species, we're going to excessively damage the mitochondrial DNA that is there. It's unprotected compared to the nuclear DNA. So as mitochondrial DNA is damaged and mutated, we're going to have a progressive decline in mitochondrial function, and we're going to have a bioenergetic decline in terms of ATP production. And that is going to lead to all the diseases that we've talked about throughout the mitochondrial heteroplasmy series. However, what we have not talked about, at least in any real form, has been, can you even begin to reverse mitochondrial heteroplasmy? Is this something that's even reversible? And if it was, what would be the strategy about how to do it? And then today, we're going to at least talk about how that potentially could happen and how it does happen. So this paper, depending on when you watch this video, is very recent, March of 2024. And it's got a neat title, a very provocative title, Starving Out the Mutant Genome. And it's exactly what we are interested in in this video. High levels of pathologic or pathogenic mitochondrial DNA variants lead to severe genetic diseases and the accumulation of such mutants may contribute to common disorders. Thus, selecting against these mutants is a major goal in mitochondrial medicine. Although, mutant mitochondria can drift randomly, mounting evidence indicates that active forces play a role in the selection for and against mitochondrial DNA variants. The underlying mechanisms are beginning to be clarified, and recent studies suggest that metabolic cues, including fuel availability, contribute to shaping mitochondrial heteroplasmy. In the context of pathologic or diseased mitochondrial DNAs, remodeling of nutrient metabolism supports mitochondria and deleterious mitochondrial DNAs and enables them to outcompete functional variants or wild type variants owing to a replicative advantage. The elevated nutrient requirement represents a mutant Achilles heel because small molecules that restrict nutrient consumption or interfere with nutrient sensing can purge cells of deleterious mitochondrial DNAs and restore mitochondrial respiration. If that's not music to a mitochondriac's ears, I don't know what is. So essentially to recap, what they're saying is that there is a intricate dance of fitness for either wild type healthy mitochondrial DNA or a diseased pathologic mutant DNA. And that balancing act and the percent of each one of those is called the percent heteroplasmy or heteroplasmy. Mutant mitochondrial DNA and dysfunctional mitochondria have an Achilles heel because they require more and different nutrients to survive than the healthy mitochondria. So what they're saying is they're using small molecules to starve off those important nutrients for the mutant mitochondria, which support and give an unfair advantage to the healthy mitochondria. Let's look at how that may happen. So this is a really cool representation of a mitochondria. And it's blowing up, in particular, this mitochondrial cristae here. And on the mitochondrial cristae, we have oxfos, or oxidative phosphorylation. And these protein complexes are transferring electrons, pumping protons, and making ATP. And right next to it is mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA is making important subunits and proteins that are responsible for all of this to happen effectively. It doesn't make all of the proteins. It just makes an important portion of those proteins. And when those DNA are damaged, then these proteins are misfolded. They don't function adequately and we don't do this like we're supposed to. So therefore, when we have all a wild type situation, all greens, we have healthy colonies of mitochondria, we have a good redox balance, we have adequate ATP being produced, and the system is running smoothly. However, as these mutants start to take hold, we develop symptoms and more symptoms. And then at some point, we hit an energetic threshold and we become diseased or we develop a disease process that's able to be diagnosed by someone. And the goal of reversing mitochondrial heteroplasmy is going to be giving 
some therapy and we'll talk about what that may look like in the future because this is not something that we can unfortunately cover in one 10 minute video but we're going to talk about therapies that can lower this threshold lower our mitochondrial heteroplasmy below the threshold to where you have either a managed symptom situation but you don't have a full disease or we go all the way back to where it's actually healthy we're energetic we're vibrant and i think that most of us mitochondriacs that's where we want to be at this is our goal we want to go back here the question is how so this is a very interesting slide and I want to kind of dissect this. So when they talk about in this graphic recycling, I want you to think about recycling as autophagy or mitochondrial specific autophagy, mitophagy. That is how mitochondria are recycled. And that is one major way of how the body gets rid of damaged mitochondria. And we're going to talk about mitophagy as well as all the other mitochondrial dynamics in an entire micro series, because it is critically important to understand how to maintain mitochondrial health and to lower mitochondrial heteroplasmy. But when it says basal or elevated recycling or disabled recycling, they're meaning a baseline functioning of mitophagy. If you have elevation, and autophagy or disabling of autophagy, that's what it's referring to here. And then demand would be if there is a increased need put on the cell and through certain signaling cascades, such as PGC1 alpha, there is going to be an increase in mitochondrial replication or biogenesis. And depending on the situation, we can tilt it in our favor or against our favor. So let's start at the top, basal recycling or basal mitophagy and, and in a basal demand, it's going to favor the mitochondrial mutations and you're going to have mutations winning out and you're going to increase your mitochondrial heteroplasmy. If you have elevated recycling and elevated demand, which is probably our best case of maintaining health, then the wild type will win out, the mutants will become destroyed, or the mutants will become selected out for, and we're going to remain in a healthy situation. The AKA for this, if you're skipping ahead, would be increased mitophagy and increased mitochondrial biogenesis. That's, that's the solution, okay? If we have basal recycling and then low demand, Still, the damaged mitochondria are being recycled more than they're being replenished. So therefore we would still win out, but we may have low amounts of mitochondria or low amounts of mitochondrial function still because we don't have as many mitochondria. I think this is probably the second best situation. And then if we have absolutely disabled or the inability to recycle mitochondria through mitochondrial autophagy or mitophagy, but yet we still have a demand, whether it be low, high, or indifferent, we're going to favor the mitochondrial DNA that is damaged and it's going to increase our mitochondrial heteroplasmy. I know for some of you who have maybe never heard of mitochondrial dynamics, you've never heard the word mitochondrial autophagy or mitophagy, you've never heard the word mitochondrial biogenesis, fission, fusion, etc. We're going to do an entire micro series on mitochondrial dynamics, and we're going to understand this at a high level. But that being said, I want to underscore how important this graphic here is on this slide to understanding how mitochondrial heteroplasmy advances and how it reverses. And I do acknowledge this is at a high level, as in a 20,000 foot view level of how this process happens. It's not the granular practical information that we're probably craving, but just bear with me. We're going to get there. But I have to lay this groundwork, this foundational understanding before you'll understand why these principles that we're going to be recommending will be important and why they work. Because if you don't understand why they work or if they're important or why they're important, it's unlikely, even with the best of intention, you're going to do it. If you like this video, please share it with family and friends, like the video and subscribe if you want to get more content like this. If you want to be a part of our mitochondriac journey through how to maintain health and reverse diseases. If you have an interest in mitochondrial function or dysfunction, this is the channel for you. Until next time.